God prompts you. What does that look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? What? Like you need to just do it right away. You need to do something, right? Right. And it absolutely will line up with his word. Any other thoughts? It's a prompting of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit. You feel something that is, whether you're supposed to pray or do something or seek, seek say, you feel like you need to get the word. There's absolutely. That tells you. So tonight's lesson is on the prompting, and it's amazing how, how, what's the word I'm trying to think of, how amazing God is, but I mean, he not only answers prayer, but he does it in such a way that you look back and you're like, that was a God thing. Mm -hmm. That was a God thing. Mm -hmm. So obviously, a lot of you knew last week that our bird that we had for eight years um, died. And her mate, Mango, is 10 years old. She was eight. They were together for 10 years. Amazing. Uh, and inseparable. They would make Romeo and Juliet look like friends. <laughs> they were so romantic, it was pathetic. Aww. I used to tell Dan we need to get them a room. I mean, it was constant. It was like he would have his wing around her. I mean, I never saw anything like it. So I was really upset, and I really was wondering what would happen to him, and I think I'm more upset than he is, which I really don't quite understand, except for I'm laughing because... Um, when my mom went into the nursing home and my father wasn't feeling well, I was like, Dad, do you want to be in the nursing home with Mom? He goes, oh, no, 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 no. You know, after 63 years, no, no, just go bring me to the veterans, you know, but whatever. So who knows? But any case, I was prompted by God. Um, I first went to PetSmart and I could not believe the prices of animals. They have gone up skyrocket. They wanted like oh, close to $800 for a bird. And I, I couldn't justify it. I just couldn't. So I was like, okay, Lord, so now what do I do? And he really laid it on my heart to contact certain people. And one was my sister-in-law. And in fact, she was part of this organization for Connors, which is the type of bird I have because she has one of my babies. And this woman, was, and I said to her, I said, Anne, I want a three-year-old female. Because if I get a baby, he's going to bully her. And if she's three, she'll put him in his place, and that'll be good for him because he needs it, trust me. And it's like, so, yeah, that's what I would love to have, and this is the price that I'm willing to pay. So, anyway, this woman is um, giving me her bird next Thursday, and Whoa. she's three, and it's a female, and it was actually less than what I was offering. So I was just sat there going, thank you, Lord. God has a way of prompting but he answers prayer. And I know that seems silly. Oh, my goodness, it's a bird. But honestly, it's not just a bird. It's everything. You need to listen to those prompts because God has something special for you. And I think we miss out a lot because we don't listen to the prompts. We just kind of rush into things. We go by our emotions, right? And we just don't wait on the Lord. God had a plan. And uh, so God is good, amen? He's always good. Amen. So I'm looking forward to meeting this woman. Let me back up. It was interesting because I saw this other woman. Uh, I, was, I also did a search. And she had many, many babies. And she raises them. She's a breeder. She wanted more. Um, but I just felt I should call her anyway. So I called her and come to find out that she had a heart condition. And I said, you know what? Nothing's a coincidence. You answered the phone. Let me just pray with you. And that's exactly what I did. Now, I don't know what will come of that, but I really feel I was meant to call her just to pray for no other reason. So you know what? Don't think things just happen. They don't just happen. There's no such thing as coincidence. Can you say that? There's no such thing. I'm telling you, no such thing as coincidence. So let's begin. It says, some of life's best experiences begin unexpectedly. It's possible these moments might happen more often if we listen carefully to how God is leading us. These divine encounters are God-arranged. Nothing is a coincidence. So right there, the emphasis is, if we would pay more attention, I think you would have a lot more of these experiences that I'm talking about, that you realize like, oh, I bumped into you three times. What's the chances? Well, there's a reason. There's a reason. Amen? 
So Amen. God has a plan for all of us. Mm -hmm. Two men named Philip appeared in the accounts of the early church. One was a disciple of Christ. The other was a man chosen along with Stephen to serve as one of the deacons. Like Stephen, this Philip had a way with people. He was also sensitive to God's leading. So it was that he found himself walking along a major road uh, led south from Jerusalem through Gaza towards Egypt and Ethiopia when he heard the sounds of a traveling caravan. He is this? Uh, this is just my introduction. Okay, so when he heard the sound of a traveling caravan behind him, he quickly discovered that God had arranged a special appointment for him. So, Lori, it's actually in Acts 8.26. That's where we're going. So let's look at Acts 8.26, okay? And um, it's, so let's read it first. I think that would be the best thing to do. Does anyone want to? Thank you. Go ahead. Got it? And the angel of the Lord spake unto spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza with right. the desert. Okay, so he hears an angel speak to him. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a moment. It's so it's so strange today if you tell someone that the Lord has spoken to you. They look at you as if there's something wrong with you. All through the Bible, the Lord spoke to people. He spoke to Noah to build an ark. He spoke to Jonah to go to Nineveh. He spoke to Moses to deliver his people. He spoke to Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees, is it East, I think, and many more, too numerous to mention. The problem today is the Lord still speaks, but few are listening. I'm going to say that again. The Lord still speaks. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's speaking, okay? But few are listening. We see here that Philip is told to go towards the south. He was not told why, just to go. Does God have to give you an explanation why you need to do something? No. And you know what? I've learned a long time ago, just do it. Quit questioning God, okay? But here's another thing. It says the Lord still speaks, but few are listening. Why do you think few are listening? <laughs> huh? We are so busy. Distracted. We are so distracted. We don't know what the left hand's doing. And they don't have a relationship. And we don't have, oh, I love that. We don't have a relationship. Especially the generation after mine. So, you know, we're talking about my kids, how old are they now? 40s? That generation, and unfortunately, beyond that, they don't have a relationship with God. If I say Jesus, they probably would say Jesus who? If you ask a child in school, which I have, just for the fun of it, who was Goliath? Who was Adam and Eve? Kids look at me like I'm nuts. I don't know. You know? Like, to me, though, like, everyone should know Goliath, at least. But kids in school today don't go to church. They definitely don't read the Bible, so they don't know. They don't know anything. And all they're being taught is that, I forgot what I, I posted it. Is it 4,500 religions? Uh, yeah, 4,000. 4,000 something, right? 4,200. 4,200 religions in this world, but only one leads to Christ. But these kids are taught that they all lead to Christ. And I love the other thing I posted. If you have problems with gender, go milk a bull. Yeah, we are who we are, but this world is changing. It's changing <laughs> drastically and very, very quickly if you haven't noticed, okay? But people are too busy. They're too busy for their kids. They're too busy for each other. And I hate to say it, they're too busy for themselves. I don't know the last time most women, you know, are shaving their legs anymore. We don't have time. Who has time for that? <laughs> who has time, right? And to go to all these places now is so expensive. People just aren't doing it. But you know, it's sad because we're losing that whole thing about taking care of yourself, doing things as a family, going on a picnic, going places. We're too busy. So it's a concern. All right, Acts 8.27. Lori, do you want to go on? Go ahead. Okay, so he comes upon.
upon this man. He's a eunuch. He has no idea who he is. Now, did it just happen by mistake? Was it a coincidence? No. No. But this man is by himself and he's reading his Bible. Okay? So, in those days, Ethiopia was a large kingdom located south of Egypt. Eunuch, this can refer to one who has been emasculated or generally to a governmental official. It's likely he was both, like, uh, since Luke refers to him as a eunuch and as one who held a position of authority in the queen's court, that of a treasurer, much like a minister of finance or secretary of treasury. As a physical eunuch, he would have been denied access to the temple and the opportunity to become a full proselyte to Jesus, uh, to, I'm sorry, to Jews, uh, Judaism. So this gentleman was castrated. And they did that for many reasons. One, so his whole focus would be on his uh, loyalty to those in authority. But this man is also in authority. He has a high position. In this case, he's a treasurer, OK? But because of his condition and because of his job, he would not be allowed to study in the temple. But evidently, if he's by himself reading the Bible, he's very much interested. He wants to know about the Lord. And I'm just thinking, you know, there's so many Christians who say, oh, I love the Lord, I'm a Christian, I'm this, I'm that. But if you ask them honestly, how much time do you spend with God? How much time do you spend in the Word? There's something to be said about your time alone with God. Because the words become very real. So, you know, we depend a lot of times on regurgitation. So a pastor speaks, he regurgitates what he read. I'm speaking, I'm regurgitating too. My main reason for teaching, besides that I love it, is because it forces me to really read it, understand it. Because if you can't read it and understand it, how am I going to regurgitate it? You know, how am I going to teach it? How am I, you know what I mean? I got to get it right. And sometimes I have to read it like eight times. It's like, what is my problem here, right? But the point is, God loves when you take that time for him. It would be kind of like, well, okay, our kids played sports, our grandkids. How do you think they feel when we go to their game? Don't they feel wonderful? It's like you took the time to watch me play. You took the time to watch me in a play. You took the time to watch me dance. You took the time to go to my honor, enrollment, whatever, and the list goes on. It means a world to a child. You know, when I think about my parents, they never went to one game. I played varsity, believe it or not, basketball, lacrosse, and hockey. Whoa. Not one game did my parents ever go to. And after a while, you get used to it. But I always go to my kids' games. And now we go to our grandkids' games. And it means everything to them. But you know what? It means a lot to me, too. Go ahead. Well, you know, I ran cross-country, and my dad would always come to see me. But he only sees me at the beginning and the end. Because ah. you don't see. Like, True. But True. it's amazing that he would stay there. But yeah, it's amazing that he'd stay in between, right? <laughs> but you know, when God notices mm -hmm. everything, and if you take the time, it's not about sitting there reading for eight hours. I'm not talking about that. It's not quantity, it's quality. It's not spending 10 hours with your kids, but quality time. That it's not like, you know, okay, I'm in the same living room and we're both on our iPad. Oh, wow, that's really being together. Come on, guys. And it's hysterical because everyone's doing it now. You go to a restaurant. Husband's on his phone, wife is on her phone. And I'm starting to just put my phone in my pocketbook because it's easy to do. In the car, easy to do. And then you know what, God forbid they die, you're gonna regret those times that you could have spent speaking and talking and sharing. Same with our kids. We purposely give them the phone to play with so they'll get out of our hair. But that's a great opportunity. When we raise the seven kids, we all ate at the, at the kitchen table. And we said, how was your day? Now, I won't tell you that Dan and I sit at the kitchen table. We don't. We sit in front of the TV. We do with the TV tray. But honestly, uh, but that's probably because I talked to him during the day on the phone. But I'm just saying, that time, especially with your children, is important. You're not going to get those times back, OK? 
guys spend some quality time with each other, okay? So anyway, this is where this man is. And so uh, Acts 828, go ahead. Okay, so Acts 8.28, go ahead. Sorry. It's okay. Was returning and sitting in his period, read Isaiah, the prophet. Okay, so that's what he's doing. He's reading his Bible. The man was interested in knowing the truth about God. While no one was looking out in the desert, he was studying God's word in Isaiah. He wasn't doing it to impress anybody. He wasn't doing it, say, look at me. Like, you know, we talk about that too in the Old Testament. A lot of times the rabbis would stand on the corner and dab, you know, they would be praying and they would just make sure, like, look at me, see? See what I'm doing? I'm praying every God. God loves when you pray in your prayer closet. When nobody knows what you're doing. We talked about that. When you are generous and do something for people, it's even more fun not to let them know it's from you. Because then who are they going to thank? They're going to have to thank God. Go ahead. It's also like he knows what your heart is. He does. You know what I mean? So are you doing it out of obligation, like I'm going to pray today and read the Bible for an hour? Or is it because you have a desire? To Absolutely. You know, so he knows, obviously. Right. Okay. Um, this man was interested, like I said, in knowing the truth about God. No one's watching him. He's obviously doing it for himself. I mean, he's in the desert, right? Okay, Acts 8.30. Go ahead. Interesting. A total stranger. He goes up to this man in the chariot, doesn't know him, and he just says, Do you know what you're reading? You know what? That's a great question. And I think we need to put it in behind us, not behind us, but in our memory, because that's a great intro to talk to somebody. You know, if you see somebody reading the Bible and it's a, a it's an opportunity that if they don't understand, they can ask. Or you could share, right? Yes. Um, I love one sister, she's not here tonight, but she went up to a gentleman who came Sunday for the first time, and she said, hi, you know, I'm so-and-so, and she goes, I don't think I know you. And he goes, no, you don't, this is my first time here. And then she just started talking to him and made him feel at home. Guys, that's what we're supposed to do. So that's another key question. I don't think I know you. You know, that opens the door for them to say, good, I'm glad you don't, or no. For them to say, no, I'm new, you know? Okay. So notice the eunuch was trying to understand. He was still reading, hoping the meaning would be open to him. This man is not only one seeking God, but a truthful man as well. He's not puffed up with pride, but admits he does not understand. I think I went ahead of you. Um, that's Acts 8.30. So let's see what it says. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Oh, no, that's right. Okay. So 31. Go ahead. You got it? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. So he... The okay, you're good. Don't worry about it. So... He, Philip asks him, do you understand what you're, what you're reading? And he's like, how can I? Unless someone helps me. Open door. Open door. Perfect. Now we know why God brought him there, right? Okay, let's read the next one. Oh, well, let me do this. So it says, help is here. This help was sent from God to one who earnestly desired to know the truth. You need to understand that God is always there willing to help. If you don't understand something, if you need help finding something, if you need to be comforted, God is there. The problem is, like I said so many times, we keep going to Facebook instead of going to God. You know? Go to God first. Absolutely. Okay, go ahead. 32. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, 
and that the lamb is silent before the shear, he did not open his mouth. Okay, so I'm just curious. Does anyone know what that scripture is in reference to? <clears throat> the silent lamb is when he was uh, crucified. Who? Um, Jesus. When Jesus was persecuted and before he was crucified, and he didn't say a word. That's right. He didn't complain. He didn't say, God, why am I going through this? Why me, Lord? The better question would be, why not? Yes? That, that particular passage is called the fifth gospel. Really? Gospel. Okay. It's called the fifth gospel because it the whole our whole life, or should I say rebirth, is based on it when you think about it. Is that right? That, you know, if it wasn't that he sacrificed his life for us, we wouldn't be saved. Right? Okay. Amen. All right, so it says, we know that the leaders in the temple in Jerusalem did not even know themselves what this meant. So how could they teach someone else? You see, this was a prophetic scripture about how Jesus, the Lamb of God, would be brought before the council and how he would stand in silence as they accused him. Isaiah is written, how many years? I want to say 2,000, is it? It's a long time. I'm sorry. Does anyone know? Joe, do you? How many years? How many years? I don't know. We'll see how smart Siri is. Hey, Siri, how many years was Isaiah written before Jesus was born? Okay, I found this on the web for how many years was Isaiah written before Jesus was born? Oh, hurry up. No, no, don't disappear. 700. Is it 700? Yeah. Okay, 700 years. The point is, the crucifixion didn't even exist then. In the time that Isaiah was written, no one had ever been crucified before. So this is a prophetic scripture. That means it's something that was foretell, that was telling of the future. And it's telling of Jesus. They had no idea. They expect and still do a Messiah to come, to save the Jews, to save Israel. But they didn't think it was gonna be um, Jesus. And certainly when he comes on a donkey. They expected a knight in a, on a white stallion, okay? Trust me, when he comes again, it'll be a whole different picture. But the first time he came, it was very humbling. And he came as a sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't expect it. Okay. Um, let's go on. So uh, Acts 833, please. And his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who could speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. So it tells of his humiliation of the cross and then being taken up from the earth. Okay, so again, I mean, that was humiliating. Um, a lot of scholars have written that he was stark naked. Um, he was so unrecognizable. He was beaten not just on his front, but on his back. And the straps that they used was with um, pieces of rock and glass and stone. And by the time they were done, it was like hamburger meat. So he went through such excruciating, and he felt it. It's not like he didn't feel it excruciating death for us. And it is humiliating, right? And then they put a crown on his head. Oh, the king of the Jews. Oh, well, God. those thorns of the roses in Israel are really, really long. And when they put that crown on, it penetrated the skull. So let me tell you, it was very, very excruciating. And if anyone even saw the passion, it doesn't oh, even come God. close to what it was like. But that comes, it gives you a taste. And the taste is, oh my goodness, Lord. I'm so sorry for such a wretch like me. I'm so, so sorry. Okay, next one. The enough asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Okay, so this can, okay, so Acts, that was 834, correct? Yes. Okay, so of whom speaketh the prophet this, his confusion was understandable. Even the Jewish religious experts were divided on the meaning of this passage. Some believed the slaughtered sheep represented Israel. Others thought Isaiah was referring to himself, and others thought the Messiah was Isaiah's subject. This eunuch had no one to turn to for the truth. God had sent him help in Philip. Notice one more time that this valuable disciple of God was sent to the desert to minister to one man. You know, and so I think so many times we think, well, God doesn't notice me. The Bible says he knows every hair on your head. Now, I don't know what he does with Dennis, 
But then somewhere there's a hair follicle. <laughs> oh, it's your beard. He knows every hair in your beard. Okay. All right, Acts 8, Acts 8, 35, go ahead. That Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. There are several important things to notice in this. One thing is that Philip took up the man's Bible and taught him from Isaiah. This is a New Testament man preaching from the Old Testament. Another very important thing to note is that Philip showed him Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus is from Genesis to Revelation. The whole Bible revolves around Jesus. Notice the most important thing Philip, without hesitation, preached to this total stranger. Be instant in and out of season where the word of God is concerned. Too many churches, I think, emphasize the New Testament. You know, they say the New Testament is the bud and the old, I mean, let me say that again. The Old Testament is like the bud of a rose and the New Testament is the flower, but it's the whole thing. You can't just take half of the Bible. And when children are baptized, so often they just give them a little Bible, the New Testament. They need to the whole Testament. They need the whole Bible, not just half. And you know, some people say, well, it's too hard to read. Then pray about it. God will open it up to you. And I love what Pastor says. Don't worry about what you don't understand. Worry about what you do understand. Because that's exactly what God wants you to know for that moment. Worry about what you do understand as you read. But ask God, Lord, help me. Holy Spirit, you know, give me re revelation. Help me to understand. Okay, Acts 8, 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and then Enoch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? You see, this eunuch knew the scriptures. Yes. He knew the written word, and he readily accepted the spoken word. We see here that it's not necessary to be baptized in any particular place or even on any particular day. Notice in the next verse how Philip answers him. It's great to be baptized, but we must have something happen in our heart first. Okay, so he wanted to be baptized. Jesus was baptized, and he said that we are to do likewise. So I'm curious, is there anyone here who has not been baptized? So we all been baptized? That's wonderful. Okay, good. Good. Okay, Acts 8.37. I have 38. I'm sorry, you haven't. Well, then maybe maybe this summer will be an uh, exciting time for us, amen, because we'll get to share in it. Anybody else? It's okay. Don't be embarrassed about it. It's just sometimes people just didn't, or they're afraid of water, or whatever. Anybody else? Or they're new Christians. Or, thank you. Or they're new Christian. Well, they don't look new to me, but yeah. No, or, they're, or you're new. It's showing your accountability mm -hmm. for your fellow Christians, that I will hold you accountable. What I'm doing. Exactly. So and, and if you were baptized as a child, meaning, you know, very young, like under the age of 10 even, then you weren't baptized. Your parents baptized you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you need to do it for you. It needs to be your decision. Some people have really walked away from the Lord. And I don't mean like a little hiccup, but they're coming back and they are, you know, very repentful. And it's like, you know, I. I want to get this. Then sometimes that might be a situation where you want to be re-baptized. Re and I would just speak to the pastor and, you know, just say, okay. Well, Catholics will get themselves, their children baptized. Yes, they will. But you should, as an adult, make that decision. Absolutely. And that's the whole point. You're right. That's like just dedicating the kids. Exactly. Exactly. All right, Acts 8, 37, somebody? 38, it is. 38, sorry. I thought it was 37. Are we up? 37. 37, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thy may, with all thy heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is that 8, 37? 37. Okay, go. Okay, so... You see, new birth occurs first in your body. There isn't even a 37 on this phone. Right. And some people have um, actually even the commentary said that some uh, translations they don't have 37. 
okay? And so that will be something that we might need to look into a little more. But let's go on. Okay, you ready? You see, new birth occurs first in our heart. We must truly love God more than we love the world around us. We must destroy the desires of the flesh and live in the spirit. In Romans, we read the qualification for being saved. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says that if thou, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We see the eunuch has done just this, and now he's ready to be baptized. Okay? So it is interesting. Go ahead, then. Um, that 37, I have a note that says that some of the manuscripts don't have that. Right. Not just the translation. Yeah, that's what I'm reading, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. That's kind of weird. It is. And in my Bible, there is no 37 either. Really? Can I explain that? Thing? Please do. What do we need here? NIV. I have NIV. NIV. A lot, of people, a lot of people don't like the NIV because they think it leaves out scripture. It doesn't leave out scripture. It puts a footnote at the bottom, and the footnote tells you the truth more than King James because it tells you that that particular passage was not found in the original manuscripts. Oh. Okay? It's in some of the manuscripts, but it was not found in the original manuscripts. So can you use it as scripture? I think so, yes. But uh, they're just letting you know. They put a footnote, so they didn't leave it out. They put it at the bottom. It's there. They just want, and I'll tell you why it's important. Because if you go, for instance, if you uh, deal with a, uh, a Mormon or uh, uh, Jehovah Witness or something, and they bring up a particular scripture about the water and the son and the father, all three of them, one. Mm-hmm. And you say, see, there's proof of the Trinity. And they say, oh, no, this wasn't in the original manuscript. They know Mm-hmm. They know what was in the original manuscripts, and, and we don't. Sometimes we're ignorant. But, but that's why I like the NIV, because the NIV tells you that. Okay. But we do know that Jesus was baptized, and we do know that he said to do likewise. Okay? So why it's not or was not in the original, I don't know. That would be a good question to ask God. Okay? So I guess we'll have to wait for that. Um, Acts 8.38. Go ahead. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the Enoch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. We see here that they went into the water. This baptism, baptism was to the death of self and burial, water, and being raised to new life in Christ. Now this eunuch is a brand new spirit man in the Lord Jesus Christ. He will no longer live for the flesh, but will walk in the spirit. 39. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the Enoch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So caught away, it says, right? Yes. And he's just like Ezekiel, was also snatched away in a miraculous fashion. This was a powerful confirmation to the caravan that Philip was God's representative. So, Bonnie, hmm. was he an angel? No. Was he angel? No. No. No? no. He was caught away. He was caught away. He just went away. He just went away. Just like Elisha. Yeah. He was so, like a divine appointment. Yes. Mission accomplished. Mm-hmm. Philip was no longer needed here, so the spirit carried him away. He did not have to walk back. So, again, but it makes it miraculous. It makes it more real, I'm sure, for that eunuch. He'll not ever forget. And sometimes you need those things to happen in your life so that you're like awed by it. You know what I mean? So let me ask you this. Can God just do that? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Could he still do it today? Yes. yes. And I told you that time that I went uh, Christmas shopping for the kids and I stayed till 3 in the morning, blah, blah, blah. And... I mean, all of a sudden, everyone just cut in front of me. It was ridiculous. And I was getting certain things in my mind. and It didn't say how many you could get. And I had in my mind what to get each kid for Christmas. And this woman is trying to snatch my stuff. And I was like, like so overwhelmed by it. And I don't know who this man is to this day. All I know is he was a big guy. And all I know is he grabbed my stuff. And he said, come with me. And he grabbed my arm. He brought me to the cash register. We, I paid for it. He walked me to my car, and then he disappeared. I mean, I turned around to thank him, and he was gone. Just gone. I don't know who he was. Maybe he walked fast. 
But all I know is I found myself saying, God, thank you so, so much. That was crazy. Mm -hmm. And I will never do your, what's it called? Black Friday shopping ever again. <laughs> ever. Ever again. Okay. Uh, Acts 830, uh, 840. Sorry. Go. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Caesarea. Caesarea, Caesarea right? Thank you. Philip appears to have established his ministry at Caesarea, and that's located um, 20 miles north of Gaza. Since about 20 years later, he and his family are still there. This was a miraculous transportation of Philip. God's power is unlimited. How Philip got to Azastus, I will allow you to guess. We see here that Philip knew no fear. He preached everywhere he went. I believe the transportation Philip used to get from the desert to Az Azastus? Is it Azastus? Uh, was similar to the trip Elijah took in the whirlwind and the trip the Lord Jesus took to heaven on a cloud. All I can say is it was a miracle ride. Okay, you have the same, and I just want to emphasize this last part, the last page. You have the same spirit working with you and within you that Philip did. Some of you may think that you never heard an angel's voice but how do you know that Philip did? We assume he did, and we're taught that he did. Haven't you ever felt the nudge to go and sense the urge to speak? Who knows if the Bible were being written today that your name might be in the name in the eighth chapter of Acts? Go ahead. Um, I want to tell you this because this is, it actually lines up very well. I got up late this morning, and I normally try to do my devotions and everything in the morning before I do anything else. But I got up late and I was a little just, I just was really tired or whatever. I decided to, I was going to put on some music, music and clean. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there getting ready to do that. And I feel, I hear some, something tell me in my spirit, what about me? I'm like, aren't you supposed to get into my word? You haven't been telling me you're going to, uh, yeah. What about me? Are you going to take the time now? I was like, okay. <laughs> you guys stand corrected. So I got, I got my stuff. I did my, my morning devotions. By afternoon, something unexpected came that, to me that I wasn't expecting, and I got blessed. Amen. Yep. Amen. And just like a parent, don't we bless our kids when they do what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it? And preferably when you don't have to tell them. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Is there anyone that you are not willing to tell about Jesus? Is there any place that you're not willing to take the good news? Ask God to give you the same kind of willingness, attentiveness, and courage that you see in Philip. Let him direct you where he wants you to go. Now, how many of you went on the walk with Pastor Elena? Us three. Right? Three people went out took the time, walked for, I think it was an hour and a half, and met some people. Three of those people came to church on Sunday. Two of those people got saved on Sunday. One was a Mormon. The other gentleman said that he was on his way to do something he shouldn't have done, and he heard Elena blowing the shofar. And something just drew him to come into the church instead. All three said, we will be back. Now, I also yes. want to say that it was a different Sunday. Haven't had one of those Sundays in quite a while. It was just worship. Dan didn't get to preach because the Holy Spirit really took over. And in the end, you know, you find yourself thinking, oh, what are these new people thinking? They're never going to come back. And so I just started praying, Lord, wherever they are, don't let them leave. Just let me be able to talk to them. So the two that got saved, that I didn't know they had gotten saved, my husband, somehow they had intercepted with my husband and, and they got saved. Through me. <laughs> Through you. Oh, you brought him to me. Okay. <laughs> but the girl looked at me and she was so cute. And she goes, awesome. you guys sing a lot, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, we don't normally sing that long. 
But today is Pentecost, and I'll not apologize. It's just a different day, and God just wanted us to worship. And if that's what he wants, then that's what we're going to do. But I do want you to come back next week, because I really do want you to hear the preaching of the word. Yes. Yes. And, and her, I believe it's her husband or boyfriend, said, we'll be back. Beautiful. It's like, yes, Lord. Yeah. And then I found that other gentleman, who I really, the one who heard the shofar, you know. Yeah. And he's like, that was really different. I go, I know. And I said, but you see, it's not a religion. It's, it's a supernatural relationship with God. And if it's supernatural, it's not going to look natural. And he goes, I know, it got my attention. I'll be back. You know, we're so afraid. We're so afraid to invite somebody. And one of those people are going to speak funny. And someone's going to fall. And someone's going to shake. And someone's going to do the flag. And they're not going to come back. You know, that's the very thing that draws them back. Because it's like, what is this? Go ahead. Was your very first? It's okay. It's okay. So I was telling you on on Sunday that this is the second time the Lord has done this to me. So I was headed, I don't know, maybe six months. What was the when the the, um, the day that Elena had spoke about? Had the basketball on up on? Do you remember? She it was, was a while ago, but yes, a while ago, six months ago, maybe yeah. nine months ago. It was that particular day. So I was headed to my church down the Vestal Parkway. And he told me before I left the house to come here, but I didn't know what time service was. So I came here, I saw him the door was 11, and I was going to service at 10. So I said, I'll go down the parkway, I'll go to church, and then I'll scoot back here after because I know your worship's, you know, I could maybe walk in a few minutes late. And I got all the way down the parkway, down the Creon, Van and Creon, and he told me to do a U turn. <laughs> and I told you to go across the road. I said, well, I was going to do the call. Okay, I got in the left lane, did a U turn. I came back and I waited out front until you guys were, you know, doors were open and whatnot. So I came in, and there was an amazing message, which had, was very appropriate to sign for me. Uh, it, was, it was a sports thing going on with one of my kids, whatever. So it was very appropriate, just the whole message. And then I told you the other day, I was told Sunday morning, before I even stepped out of bed, I was, I was doing my devotionals and reading the Bible and stuff, and he told me to leave church at 1045, or 1045 and be here by 11. I said, okay. So I got up. I left church at 1047. I said, oh, sorry. So I left at 1047, I got here by like 11, and then, uh, but it was just so appropriate. And then you came up to me after and talked to me and, and Elena as well, but it was just, you know, amazing how we just, there's a reason, I'm not sure, I don't know what it is, but, you know, I told you that day, this is the second mm -hmm. time he's led me to this church. Yeah, Nothing not is a coincidence. No, what were you going to say, Christy? So I was at church on Sunday, and I saw the two the two new people that Pastor Elena, you know, the people on the streets, like, walked, came up to, and... The girl looked really scared when Pastor mm -hmm. Dan like touched her head, yeah, and I immediately seen her walk out after, and I'm like, mm -hmm. I gotta go. Like I'm gonna go. So I went out there, and I was like, Hi, how are you? I was like, I'm Christy. Like I heard it was your first time. How did you like it? And her boyfriend was like, She didn't like it at all. So she like ran inside, was like shaking, and I'm like, What? What's going on? Like, tell me what she was like, she have glasses and black hair? No, 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 she's a blonde. Yeah, more of a blonde. But she goes. So her boyfriend, she runs us on, and the boyfriend's like, he forcefully touched her, and she was really not happy. And I said, I'm going to sit and wait for a minute. I'm going to wait. So she comes back, and I'm like, listen, I, I, I'm not the one to talk to you about this. I said, pastor, our pastor's the one. I said, but I can tell you that he gently laid hands on you. I said, he was not, like, pushing your head back. I said, that was the Holy Spirit. And they're like, what is the Holy Spirit? And that right there, I was like, I was like, Pastor Dan, he was talking to somebody. I was like, sorry, I need Pastor Dan. I brought him in that room. I was like, I need you. I dragged him into that room. I was like, Pastor Dan, she wants to know what the Holy Spirit is. I like shut the door. I was like, have a good day. And here he is locked, here he is locked in the room with those two people probably like, oh, great. What the heck is going on? But, but needless to say, he... They got saved that day. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. praise yeah. God for that. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Amen. Go ahead. She was like, yeah. talk. She was like, yeah, just like today, like um, for everything that we had to get done. At first, like I, if I had this happen before, I would have called the, all the doctors and said, can we please reschedule? But something was tugging on me and saying, no, you have to take care of your health. Amen. You know, and you've got to take care of everything. And the Holy Spirit deals with all the realms of our life. Amen. Mm -hmm. So is anyone 
that you're not willing to tell about Jesus? I love what Christy said, because you see, you have to be ready in and out of season. Mm -hmm. If Christy had not gone after this child, then she probably would have left this church saying, I will never walk into a Pentecostal church again. They're crazy and they force you down. <laughs> Which is not the case. All right? But when you experience something new, you have no understanding. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll never forget when this one person fell, you know, was slain, and this little kid goes, he killed her. <laughs> no, no, no. She was brought up that one, uh -huh. where it's very different. It you know, is they different. don't lay hands, and they're not, they're not really in, in tune with right. the Holy Spirit. So that can, that can be scary to people, you know, that have mm -hmm. never. But she thought that he physically, like, was pushing her, and I was like, no, no, girl. He was, I know Pastor Dan. He was probably just lightly doing it. The Holy Spirit was just working Ruben. Right. And then she was like, what is the Holy Spirit? And I was like, yes. How many of you have been slain in the Holy Spirit? I don't know about you, but it feels like all of a sudden you're standing, all of a sudden you're down. Yeah. It feels like something just struck you like lightning. Yeah. Yeah. I know for myself, I had two teeth extracted. Um, well, actually one, I'm sorry. It was a wisdom tooth. It had seven roots, and that's documented. I guess I'm famous for my seven roots in some <laughs> dental manual. I don't know. But in any case, when they extracted it, it took three and a half hours, and I had no feeling in my face for six months. I was totally numb, like if you had the Novocaine forevermore, and I was told that it's possible that it would stay like that forever. I had just gotten saved. My mother-in-law back then said, well, you know, why don't you come to the Catholic Church with me because they're having a healing service, and this archbishop is coming, and he's going to lay hands on you, so there are charismatic Catholic mm -hmm. movements. And so I went, no idea what's going on. He put his hand on my head, he prayed over me, and the next thing I knew, I was on the ground. And when I got up, I had all feeling in my face. So you know, there are things that we don't understand, and it's okay to say I don't understand yes. it, but I thank God for it. Yes. It is supernatural. Do not put God in a box. Whoa. Do not limit the Holy Spirit's power because that's the very thing you might very well need for deliverance, healing, mm -hmm. salvation. Amen? Yep. Amen? Father, so look at the last paragraph. Because I, want, I don't want you to just say it. I want you to understand what you're saying before you say it and we conclude. Father, too many times we fail to hear you speaking to us. Remind us to be quiet before you so that we can hear your voice. May we make decisions based on your leading, not according to our goals and desires. But most of all, Father, help us to cherish the gift of your spirit. You know, we say so much to God, and we say so much to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit's left out. Make sure he's part of your conversation, because he's the one who's here. He's the one who ministers to you now. He's the one who protects you now. He's the one who guides you. He's the one. He's the one here on earth. Amen? Amen. So make sure you include all three. It is the Trinity, three and one. So if you agree, then repeat with me. Let's go. Father, too many times we fail to hear you speaking to us. Remind us to be quiet before you so that we can hear your voice. May we make decisions based on your leading, not according to our goals and desires. But most of all, Father, help us to cherish the gift of your spirit. Amen. God bless you. Sure, go ahead. Then. So I just want to make a comment because one of my devotionals that I recently started doing a couple years ago, I mean, I would always do it, I was always read, but then I would never sit and be quiet. Mm -hmm. You know, I would still hear from him, but I would never. But when you sit and you're quiet and you just are quiet, you do it and literally time it like set two or three minutes on your phone, and then the next thing you know,